thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. It's uh, likewise, it's really, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I really look forward to um, engaging with the with the audience. So I will try to keep these uh, uh, not brief, but rather uh, sort of engage, engaging and concise, because I really look forward to hearing uh, what the uh, reaction are from, from the audience. Um, you introduced everything perfectly, and just to clarify a little bit what media and use language change actually means, um, it means um, uh, to investigate um, the influence that media have uh, on the way we talk, so the way, you know, oral language, the, the way we speak uh, with, with each other. So this was rather, you know, this was the impact um, that I tried to, to uh, evidence in my PhD thesis. So you, you actually said it by right. That was my entry point in digital humanities, but now I am in the DARPA project, and today I will also talk a little bit about that. Um, but uh, my book, this is a book presentation, so I will just go ahead and share my screen, and will uh, uh, mostly uh, present, um, uh, sort of try to summarize the main parts, the main argument um, of uh, of my book. So uh, you should be uh, seeing my screen now as I speak. Um, perfect. So the uh, the title of my book is The Humanities in the Digital and uh, Column Beyond the Critical Digital Humanities. And before talking, um, uh, you know, going sort of more into depth um, about what the book is really about, I wanted to give you um, a little bit of context of what actually inspired uh, this book. So in 2020, you, I think we all remember uh, 2020, uh, and more or less uh, during the first wave of the pandemic, um, I was reading this uh, um, series of interview, uh, the 2016 uh, Los Angeles uh, um, review of books, which you may or may not be familiar with, uh, perhaps you also remember it. It was a series of interviews uh, that was titled The Digital in the Humanities. Um, and he was um, uh, basically uh, talking about how the digital now uh, had entered the humanities and was changing the way we, uh, the way humanity scholars uh, do and go about their business. And it was obviously a series of interviews with uh, people that were uh, quite into the field at the time, for instance, Franco Moretti and so on and so forth. And they were all discussing how the digital humanities was uh, this field uh, where two worlds were uh, merging, these two worlds, so the sciences on the one hand, uh, represented by computer sciences, uh, computer science and the humanities, uh, was really come together. Um, and as I was uh, reading through this interview series, uh, um, I couldn't really help but noticing uh, how, despite of all the use of all these uh, verbs, right, all these words that were suggesting unity and union, so merging, melding, coming together, um, melting, and so on and so forth. Really, what was really, um, what was rather coming across was an idea of two very separate and distinct uh, unities, distinct entities, um, that despite all efforts of coming together, they were keeping, you know, each other rather separate. And as I was reading this and I was noticing, I was reflecting on this, I was also looking at what was happening in my life at the moment. Um, and what was happening in my life at the moment was COVID, right? The COVID pandemic. So in the first wave, we were all spending every day online uh, because everything was online. Uh, myself personally, I was of course working online, um, teaching online, um, watching the news online, communicating with my family online, and I did all sorts of also leisure activities, uh, so gym classes, um, interacting with my friends and family. And I'm sure you were doing the same, because this was really what was happening. Um, so again, there were these two things that kind of were in, contr in contrast with each other. So we had the digital finally meeting the humanities, and then it was us actually living in the digital. So this was uh, what inspired the, the title of this book. The as you can see that my book is entitled uh, "The Humanities in the Digital" and not "The Digital in the Humanities." And the word "order change" is really a kind of a provocation. Uh, I wanted to signal how nowadays 
uh, discussions about how the digital has impacted and affected our lives, I think are rather uh, outdated now because it's not really so much a question of how the digital is in our life, but rather how we are all in the digital. Um, so this is just to give you really the background and the contextual information uh, of what originated this book, what inspired this book, and the title is particularly. So let's uh, go back a little bit, uh, a few years, um, and let's talk about um, the digital transformation of society widely, uh, which um, when we, we talk to it uh, referring to um, academia, we normally refer to it as the digital term. I'm sure we have all come across this term uh, many times. And what was really the digital term about and what uh, to an extent still is? So the digital term is this uh, um, uh, sort of a term. And as we all know, uh, also you as historians uh, probably know this rather well, that terms is kind of a catchy word but doesn't really mean much because these revolutions, these um, turns are uh, not at all sudden uh, events that just happen overnight. Um, they're more like painful processes that take years to implement and to stick, right? But, but, but let's say for the sake of the argument, that's how we always talk about the digital revolution. It's a turn that uh, has uh, um, uh, uh, impacted academia really, really deeply. Um, and I will talk mostly about the humanities just because this is the field closer to me. But what I talk about here in, in the book and in, in this presentation uh, could easily be applied to uh, any discipline really. Um, so in the humanities specifically, um, the digital turn was a promise uh, mostly, or at least in the earlier days, a promise of, of neutrality a promise of reliability of quantitative methods. Um, and really was this promise of being able finally to free uh, knowledge creation from subjectivity. So the humanities was kind of accused, if you will, of not being so very relevant anymore because we couldn't really prove anything. It was a deduction and mostly interpretation work based on small case studies, sources, not really data, uh, not really quantitative methods, computational exactness. Um, so the, the push was really to go digital to make the humanities more relevant uh, in an increasingly digital world. So this was the this was the, the promise, right? The first promise. But then um, it was also a promise of um, interdisciplinarity, if you will, because of what I, I said at the beginning in my very first slide. The promise was really about these two fields finally coming together, right? There was the computer science on the one hand and the humanities. Uh, they couldn't have been further. And finally, thanks to digital humanities, um, this field was able to incorporate uh, being naturally interdisciplinary. So really, this uh, um, the sort of disrupting and the dynamic essence of the digital um, was uh, in a way praised for uh, being positive for the field, being positive for academia in general and knowledge creation, because finally we were able to make the humanities uh, truly interdisciplinary. And in fact, the DH was believed to be naturally interdisciplinary. So this digital turn really uh, was, uh, uh, we, can, we can all agree on that, it was uh, accompanied by quite a, a hype of, uh, you know, uh, jumping on the digital uh, wagon, if you will. But is this really what happened? So what I'm arguing in the book is that, is this really, the, the digital humanities was really a field that incorporated um, interdisciplinarity? To what extent that we are uh, interdisciplinary? And in fact, the more widely we could even ask, is the digital actually making everything more interdisciplinary? So, Already in 2000, uh, in the year 2000, Weingart already uh, argued that um, despite of all uh, discourse and narratives, uh, which are very recurrent in an interdisciplinary discourse, um, what within our current model of knowledge creation, what tends to happen is uh, what he calls the paradox of interdisciplinarity. 
What is it? So this is like when discipline, disciplines share common interests or common fields, common areas of investigation. What tends to happen um, is not like that these discipline boundaries dissolve, but rather disciplines tend to further specialize and create yet new fields. So this was already the argument in the year 2000, so not really super new. Um, but it looks like despite of you know this being already noticed uh, over two decades ago, we still talk about uh, the digital being uh, you know this sort of essence that when you put it on the side, you know something that you put, you can do contextual to what your knowledge creation activity might be, um, whether you are a student or researcher or a scholar or scientist, a coder, whatever. So it's something that you put on the side, right? So you do your thing, uh, your research, and with something digital on the side. Um, but despite all that, um, this uh, paradox of interdisciplinarity hasn't really been further explained and uh, sort of uh, um, expanded uh, about. So to exemplify what I'm talking about here, I obviously took the, the case of this, the, the, uh, digital humanities in particular. And, uh, uh, and, and, and in fact, I think that the case of digital humanities is particularly good here because it really, it really uh, shows quite clearly what this, that the paradox of interdisciplinarity is really about. So, okay, in this timeline here, you see the, the humanities as a, a sort of the starting point. So we have the main, what you, you, you may refer to as the mainstream humanities. So this is a field that is supposedly non-digital, right? So traditional as they, uh, as we normally refer to um, them, they are supposedly non-digital. So they are traditional humanities scholars who read, you know, uh, paper books and do their analog research. So then what happened? Then, then the, the digital arrived, the digital turn arrived, the digital entered the humanities, and digital humanities was born. So if the humanities is supposedly non-digital, then digital humanities was uh, quite soon, I would say, criticized for not being critical at all. Um, this has uh, often been referred to as the dark side of digital humanities. Uh, you may have also uh, heard about this. Um, it is basically the argument that digital humanities scholars in their hype uh, uh, about technology forgot all about questions of uh, race, gender, identity, uh, religion, and all sorts of critical engagement that is uh, natural and intrinsic to the humanities. So, so basically, digital humanities scholars are just uh, um, sorry, button pushers here and there. We just click things here and there, but we don't really engage critically with anything. So again, we have a split here, don't we? So we have the humanities, and then we have the digital humanities. So you could argue that the humanities is still investigate questions that pertain to the humanity sphere. So there is an overlap there. Um, however, the digital is not really making anything interdisciplinary, but rather we have a further specialization here. We have the creation of digital uh, humanities. So how was this uh, sort of paradox solved? Well, the same people who argued that digital humanities was not critical at all, came up with this new field critical digital humanities. So critical digital humanities was really what? Was really the best of both worlds, if you will, right? So it was like, okay, let's make another field here then. Then if the humanities is non-digital and digital humanities is non-critical, then let's create a new field. Let's create a critical digital humanities. So critical digital humanities is perfect because it's still digital, but it's also critical. So fantastic. And you would think like, okay, problem solved. But of course not, because, um, you know, scholars like to argue with each other. So obviously the argument was that, well, okay, but if we have this other field that is critical digital humanities, what is this critical digital humanities actually about? Is it going to be practice led or is it going to be research led? So again, there was a split within the same field, right? This newly born field already there were disagree there was disagreement. And the disagreement was, okay, but uh, if you become 
button pusher yourself, then you are a humanities, a digital humanities scholar. So you cannot really be critical digital humanity, a humanities scholar. And then the other side of the coin was, okay, but then uh, uh, if you are only theoretical, then you can't really um, be in digital because then again, you are just, so the, what is the difference between a critical digital humanities scholar and a humanities scholar? So again, this paradox, in a way, this argument is still to this day not solved by the way. So it's still an open debate of what this critical digital humanities should be doing. So do you see what I'm getting here, right? So the paradox of interdisciplinarity is really well uh, explained. Uh, it's really not what happens when when disciplines overlap or have things in common they don't really merge and the boundaries do not really dissolve but we tend to create yet new disciplines and i could call i could go on right with my example i could make the example of digital history i could make the example of digital heritage studies or critical digital heritage studies and so on and so forth of course for the sake of the example i will just stop here so what is the problem and what is, uh, um, how does this relate to the main argument of my book? So the main argument of my book is that um, interdisciplinarity doesn't really work because we still operate within a model of knowledge creation that encourages disciplines and separation. So we still work in um, a model that divides the disciplines into boxes and uh, into boundaries. And uh, there isn't much space for overlapping. And when this space of overlapping happens, then, um, like I said, discipline further, uh, disciplines further specialize. The problem with this the current model, model, model of knowledge creation, which to be fair, also creates uh, hierarchies, right? We have disciplines that are supposedly more valid, valuable and more worthy than others, has to do with the wider separation of our model of knowledge creation, which is again, the stories of two cultures, right? So the sciences versus the humanities. And this is, uh, uh, you know, something that uh, uh, I think uh, um, the, 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 the main uh, argument of my book is that this is uh, really the point, the point of um, uh, what the digital has done and forces us to reconsider is not really the creation of yet new fields that could do that could fix this or, or that problem, but really um, the digital transformation of society that has uh, started a few decades ago, but it was really accelerated exponentially by the COVID pandemic now forces us to have the conversation that really needs to happen. So a conversation that tells us, okay, this is a model of knowledge divided into disciplines doesn't really work uh, anymore because the digital has now entered everything. And it's not just a matter of um, the humanities and a little bit of things that you do with data or tr data transformation, but now we are also digital citizens and everything that we do is mediated by the digital, whether you produce or knowledge consciously or not, even when you claim or you don't think of yourself like a humanity, a digital um, scholar or a digital researcher or a digital student, yet you are, yet we all are. <clears throat> Again, this uh, point was uh, already made two decades ago when technology was uh, uh, really had started to enter our lives. So um, I would say, uh, you know, sort of strongly, um, scholars already started to notice how this uh, uh, contemporary model of knowledge creation divided into disciplines doesn't really work, uh, doesn't really work anymore because technology forces us to um, really uh, reinterpret and reinvent precisely those models and frameworks and methods uh, that we are using. So we cannot really do anything anymore that is considering and is uh, already working within this knowledge model of knowledge creation that forces us within a box, within um, a discipline. So what has changed? Why is so urgent? If this point was already made in 2002, 
why I am remaking this point. Again, I'm remaking this point because I think the COVID-19 pandemic added further layers of complexity to our societies, to our lives, to academia, to higher education, to the way we produce knowledge today. I think this is why this book um, could not wait any longer to be out and needed to be, and also could not come out, I don't know, five years ago. I think this book needed to come out right after the pandemic to force us to reconsider this uh, um, sort of outdated uh, model of this of knowledge creation we all live in. Let's uh, uh, now talk about what I mean precisely with that. So, because precisely because I don't want to operate within a model of uh, knowledge creation that is still constrained by disciplines, I um, sort of came up with uh, rather a framework. So a framework that does not start from any discipline, but just from the uh, digital object. And digital objects are created regardless of the discipline you uh, operate within. It can be history, it can be science, it doesn't really matter. You still create a digital objects. Even when you send a tweet, you are effectively creating a digital object that will be heritage of tomorrow. So let's all think about that. Um, so I called this uh, framework the post-authentic framework, and I will not elaborate further uh, at the moment uh, in, the, in the presentation for the sake of time, why I decided to call it the post-authentic framework, but please do ask questions in the Q&A session, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to elaborate further on this. So the post-authentic framework is a, a rather simple framework um, that, only, uh, that is only based on three um, principles. So the first principle is what I have been saying uh, so far, and that is that the digital does not happen to knowledge, rather knowledge today happens in the digital. So this is exactly the example of, for, for example, you know, us creating a tweet today, and this tweet, uh, you know, you create it in your personal life, for example, for your, um, I don't know, something that is not specifically linked to your work as a researcher. But then somebody does a research on tweets that contain the hashtag that you used. So you have become an object of study now. The person who will investigate that um, will, will use your digital object for their study. Again, you didn't think about that, right? Perhaps you still consider yourself as a, a, a non-digital scholar, and yet you become one, even if you're not aware of it. So knowledge today happens in the digital. This is the first principle. The second principle is that computational objectivity is an illusion. And this requires a couple of slides um, to be elaborated further. I don't know how many of you uh, play chess or are familiar with chess uh, uh, play. Um, so this is the Mechanical Turk. So the Mechanical Turk um, was invented uh, by Wolfgang von Kempelen in uh, the late uh, 19th century. Uh, so this was uh, um, a machine that was uh, uh, claimed to be able to play a game of chess uh, completely autonomously without the input of any human. So as you can see, uh, so th this machine became super popular, by the way. It was uh, uh, paraded and shown uh, to all around Europe and also in the Americas for over 80 years. And in fact, it defeated uh, illustrious opponents like Napoleon Bonaparte and uh, Benjamin Franklin. So it was really popular. It was quite quite an attraction back then. And the way they were showing this uh, machine was the, uh, as you can see, there was this machine, uh, the Mechanical Turk, and there was uh, the chessboard, and then they would open um, the panels uh, to show that there was nothing inside. It was just these uh, uh, clocks, clocks and uh, engines. Um, so what really uh, the Mechanical Turk was, uh, was obviously a very uh, ingenious uh, uh, illusion, mechanical illusion. So of course there was a, a human uh, hidden inside the machine. It was uh, um, quite a, a, a very ingenious uh, uh, <laughs> illusion. 
Um, so there was a human hidden that was making all the moves, making all uh, the decisions. Um, and uh, despite of that, of course, despite giving the illusion, of course, of being autonomously, of course, there was a human inside it. But, but again, the, the illusion, the trick worked pretty well for over eight years. Um, so why am I making this a comparison with the Mechanical Turk? So today, uh, uh, you know, because of course of Hollywood, uh, particularly, we are uh, used to think of artificial intelligence and computational technology a little bit uh, um, like a, a mechanical Turk, right? So we are uh, given the illusion of a, a fully autonomous um, a product, a, a fully autonomous uh, uh, process that does not involve uh, humans at all. And of course, so we are also look, uh, used to, uh, you know, these uh, completely unrealistic representations of uh, artificial intelligence, just because, you know, it's it's cool. But in reality, what is uh, artificial intelligence really? Well, in reality, artificial intelligence looks more like this, the picture on your um, uh, left, I think. Um, so lines and lines and lines of code that uh, give instructions, so write algorithms, as algorithms are instructions uh, that we give to the machine to perform a task. A task can be anything, right? It can be a Google search, um, can be, um, I don't know, uh, tracing your heartbeat, it can be anything. These, uh, behind this task that has been performed, there is an algorithm that contains code that has been written by a human. And uh, um, these, uh, uh, I think, of course, this uh, uh, computational illusion works pretty well because we've been invaded by technology and we've been invaded by um, this uh, uh, hype about you know, the neutrality, the possibility to quantify everything, and the possibility also to be freed from subjectivity, interpretations, and biases, right? This is the promise uh, of artificial intelligence uh, mostly. And it has worked uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, success because we really, uh, we really create an incredible amount of data every day, and everything is now governed by by data. In uh, 2017, IBM reported that more than 90% of the world's data had appeared in the two previous years alone, and this is a lot of data. And now we create data at, at an unprecedented speed. Um, of course, in order to process all this data, we need algorithms. Uh, there is no human that can do that uh, manually. Um, on the other hand, humans are needed to write the algorithms. And there you have it. And that's why we have uh, the illusion uh, that we have the computational objectivity because these operation, these operation, these tasks can be performed at incredible speed. Um, it just gives you a result that looks rather neutral. And that's why we tend to forget there is always a human uh, behind this uh, uh, result, always. There is, has been a human behind the, the algorithm that wrote that particular um, uh, uh, task, that performed that particular task, but also there have been, there are uh, humans behind the company, the, 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 you know, that created the whole machine that is producing these algorithms. Which leads me to the third uh, principle of the post-authentic framework. The third principle is that digital objects bear consequences. And again, this is, uh, uh, this is something that um, I think um, has not really been uh, elaborated uh, upon uh, enough. In fact, it has been quite neglected. So, Really, what uh, what I mean by this is that um, because it's masked um, uh, by the illusion that everything is uh, uh, neutral and fair and uh, um, autom automatic and bias free, then we don't think that whatever we do um, will have consequences uh, digitally. Uh, there are many examples of uh, digital consequences, right? Um, in my book, I elaborate uh, on this. Um, I, I have a whole chapter that describes these digital consequences, and the section is uh, titled The Algorithm Made Me Do It. 
Um, and uh, there I really uh, talk about all these examples. But here I want to give you one example that I think is indicative of what might happen or what actually happened and happens, um, the kind of wider digital consequences, not just in terms of what algorithms and data can do when we scale everything up globally, but also what that does uh, to our conceptualization of uh, the digital in general. Okay, let me, let me give you an example of that, of one digital consequence. So in 2003, uh, UNESCO uh, declared um, her digital heritage as um, heritage, heritage as a proper heritage, so heritage as much as material heritage. So this is uh, 2003. So um, note that obviously today this uh, uh, this claim, this statement, doesn't really uh, shock us at all. Of course, digital heritage is also heritage, but back then, 20 years ago, this was quite uh, a stir because it was the official declaration that the digital had now entered the material world, right? So heritage designation has always traditionally been something about material culture, right? So archeological sites, um, museum objects, art in general, pictures, and, and so on and so forth. So, so talking about digital heritage as heritage, was really something very innovative uh, 20 years ago. But what, uh, uh, let's have a look at the wider consequences of this statement, right? So um, obviously uh, when uh, UNESCO designates uh, something as heritage, there is the intrinsic uh, discourse, the intrinsic uh, concept behind it, that this heritage is worth preserving. And this heritage was also at risk of disappearing. So. We want to preserve this particular heritage before it disappears. And because it's worth it, we do not want it to disappear. So this is the argument of heritage designation, right? So because of this uh, uh, paradigm of digitization equal preservation, what stemmed by this statement was that preserved became worth preserving, right? So if I preserve something, like I said, it's because it's worth preserving. Therefore, if you digitize heritage, this is uh, 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 the act of digitizing becomes the act of preserving something, right? And we see that all the time. We see that in, uh, for instance, Europeana and other digital heritage institutions, the Library of Congress digitize um, a lot of material sources because the digitization is now uh, really because of this statement in, 20, uh, in 2003, digitization now becomes an act of preservation. But because of the paradigm of digitizing, uh, preserving, preserved, worth preserving, then digitized means worth preserving, right? Um, but what we need to now focus our attention uh, to is that, um, Heritage designation is uh, uh, not just a magnanimous act of, you know, uh, preserving the symbols of previous societies and previous cultures. Um, because preserving uh, heritage is very costly, then of course there are uh, many uh, decisions, many factors that uh, intervene in this decision of what to designate as a heritage. And even more so, when this implies digitization, because this digitization is very costly. Um, so when you have to, and when this is, you know, um, something that uh, libraries and heritage institutions have to uh, face all the time, when they have to decide what to digitize, they have to make decisions. They have to discuss uh, what is the cost and because there is money involved, they also have to discuss what is the value in return of this investment. So when so, uh, heritage institutions have to decide which societies and which cultures, um, obviously political interests, economic interests, and biases of all kinds are never far away. So 
again, if you say that um, uh, digitizing something is preserving, and when you preserve something, it's because it was worth preserving. When you filter something out, you are obviously intrinsically saying, but wait a minute, if we're not digitizing this, is that because it's not worth preserving? And this is uh, an example of the wider digital consequences because consider that today, only 20% of uh, European uh, heritage exists in digital form. And this percentage is uh, um, believed to remain at 15% globally. So imagine the 80% the of uh, European heritage and um, actually 85% of uh, uh, global heritage is not preserved at all, right? It's not digitized at all. But of course, we are always uh, uh, thought that, oh, everything is digital now, you know, uh, everything exists in a digital format now. Well, not at all, actually. Um, we have left a lot behind. And uh, every time, if something is digital today, it's because a committee somewhere decided that that was worth digitizing and that other things were not worth digitizing at all, or not for the moment, at least. Um, Another wider consequence of this decision is that most of the digitization programs, at least in the early days, uh, took place in the US, or in any case, in the global north, um, and uh, which of course prioritized uh, works that were uh, of their countries, but also works that uh, were in English. And a digital consequence of that is that uh, today, most of uh, what we have in a digital form is in English. Um, of course, there are exceptions, and of course, this is changing, but still the majority of work exists in English, but not just that, it also exists for English. So engines, um, language models, OCR, digitization software, uh, algorithms, uh, packages, uh, all these things have been optimized for English because the majority of resources exist in English. So as you can see, the wider uh, digital consequence of all that is that what we have done um, is uh, to perpetuate and reiterate the same biases, the same um, uh, subjective interpretations that actually uh, had already been taking place for the past century. So already, heritage designation had been uh, the result of clear decisions that were political and economical. Um, and now we are further uh, reinforcing those models on what is digital today. So this leads me to my last uh, slide already. Um, and uh, um, I want to um, just to reiterate my point and wrap it up. Um, just to say that, um, so the point of the, the of the post-authentic framework is, uh, like I said, again, starting from uh, the digital object that we create or we investigate rather than from the disciplines in which the digital object itself is created. This allows us to free um, or to at least operate into, uh, so beyond a model uh, in, of knowledge creation that really separates knowledge into disciplines. So the post-authentic framework is uh, uh, obviously not the answer. It's just my uh, modest uh, contribution to uh, start a conversation that I, th I think is required and that I think is necessary today. Um, something that we need to think about when we uh, collect when we assess, when we review, when we enrich, when we analyze, when we visualize a digital material. Um, so it basically gives us a more problematized notion of the digital um, that has been um, done so far. Um, and uh, uh, I think what the digital transformation of society has uh, really done now uh, which is quite apparent is 
the digital inequality and inequality at large has now actually worse than ever. Um, but also never in history um, has it happened that uh, knowledge was mediated digitally and the, this platform, this medium that mediates knowledge creation is basically created by a tiny minority, uh, a tiny demographic minority, which is predominantly male, white, um, English speaking, and between the age of 30 and 45. So never in history this has been the case. How this tiny minority that uh, basically dictates how we produce knowledge today not influence the way we do? So this is really the question that my book is trying to answer. We cannot longer ignore that this is uh, the case and we have to acknowledge that a racist, sexist, homophobic digital society is not so much a reflection of human subjectivity in data and algorithms, but proof of its pretend absence. So let's just stop pretending. Thank you so much and I will now take some of your questions. Thank you.